Good evening. I'm Rick Trainer. I'm principal of King's College London, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you not only to this evening, but to the whole of the uh, Arts and Humanities Festival for this year. And this is set in the context, of course, of the long-standing but also very current importance of the School of Arts and Humanities and the wide range of subjects represented in it to the teaching and research of the college, uh, but also to its public engagement. Um, universities these days rightly pay an increasing attention to the way in which they interact with the world around them. For the last few years, we've had an explicit commitment to public engagement at King's College London, and not least um, in the School of Arts and Humanities, and the now well-established annual uh, Arts and Humanities Festival is a, a prime expression of that. As many of you will know, the, this year's Arts and Humanities Festival constitutes two weeks, beginning with this event. Um, more than 40 events, talks, exhibitions, and performances ranging across the full range uh, of the very broad subject matter of our School of Arts and Humanities, and including also quite a lot of events um, which cross the disciplinary boundaries within it and indeed go well beyond. The festival is organized by the Arts and Humanities Research Institute, whose twofold mission is first to foster and showcase research in the school, and second, importantly, I think, to build bridges between the arts and humanities on the one hand and other disciplines uh, as well. The theme of this year's festival, as showcased on our screen in the moment, is being human. The festival looks not only at the role of the arts and humanities in developing the concept of humanity, but also at ways, ways in which that concept has been challenged by modern technological and scientific developments, as well as critical theories touching on the relationship between humans and animals, on race, or on psychoanalysis, for example. So you'll find sessions in this admirable program, which I hope a lot of you have handy. Um, you'll find examples uh, of genetics, robotics, medical ethics, alongside conversations about modernity, science fiction, including medieval science fiction, that's intriguing, zombies, philosophy, and especially tonight, music. So this festival is a way in which we not only showcase what's going on in arts and humanities, um, but also knit together uh, all these various fields around an important theme, and indeed uh, help to knit together the whole of King's College London with its wide range of subject matter from the humanities right through to the social uh, and natural sciences and of course the biosciences. So it gives me great pleasure to inaugurate the 2013 Arts and Humanities Festival and it remains for me to introduce the person who's going to introduce this session and that's Professor Max Saunders who's of course Professor of English here He's director of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute, and especially tonight, director of the festival. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Principal, um, and a very warm welcome to, to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful to see um, such a good turnout on this uh, wet Friday evening. Um, but I'm not surprised. It's, it's a great boon for Kings that we have both George Benjamin and Martin Crimp here tonight um, to talk about their wonderful opera, Written on Skin, um, which is going to be the main focus of our discussions this evening. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly pleased that they're here to talk about it, not just because it is such a good opera, but because um, as its title suggests, it really speaks to the theme of being human. Indeed, it even um, speaks about it at one point when the character called the Protector says, make each man ashamed, yes, to be human. Well, I hope the festival as a whole won't make you feel ashamed uh, at human being, uh, or at least not only that, uh, but that, like this opera, it will give a sense of the range of experiences, often conflicting ones, that make us human. 
it seemed the perfect work to set the tone for the next two weeks um, and to launch the festival with. Um, there, there are a couple of things I wanted to say about the festival quickly before we get onto that. One is that there, there are, well, that there are two events um, sort of happening through it, um, which I wanted to draw your attention to. One is the exhibition of sculpture by Gilbert Wyman, which is in the quad. You may have seen some of the figures already on your way in. There are 13 pieces there um, dotted around at different sites on the quad, uh, and they'll be there for the whole festival. Um, so I do recommend you go and have a look at those. And in the second week of the festival, at particular times, which are all listed on the website, um, there's going to be a um, show called Bending Light, when the, the King's Building that we're in now will be illuminated, um, and strange things will be done with it, with light. Uh, so again, I do recommend you to ha have a look at when those are and see if you can ar arrange to coincide with one of them. Uh, that's being done by, I mean, it's a digital projection being done by the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. The, the format for this evening is going to be that the three of us will have a conversation um, about the opera, uh, after which we'll then open the proceedings up to questions from the audience. And that'll then be followed by a reception, which will be in the entrance lobby just outside the Great Hall here. Um, and then um, immediately after that, um, from 8.30 until 10, there'll be a screening of Written on Skin, uh, which we're um, you know, very glad to, to be able to present. That's going to be in the Anatomy Lecture Theatre, which is also in this building, but on the sixth floor. So you'll need to take some lifts probably up to that. Uh, and uh, the student ambassadors will be sort of reminding people when it's a good time to leave the reception if they want to go and see that. Um, so it's now a, a great pleasure to introduce our two speakers, George Benjamin, um, who taught composition at the Royal College of Music in London for 16 years, where he became the first Prince Consort Professor of Composition before he succeeded uh, Sir Harrison Birtwistle as the Henry Purcell Professor of Composition here at King's. Uh, in 2001. He studied with Olivier Messiaen at the Paris Conservatoire. He then read music at King's College, Cambridge, studying under Alexander Gurr. Um, his orchestral piece, Ringed by the Flat Horizon, which was originally written for the Cambridge University Music Society, was then performed at the Proms that August while he was still a student, uh, making him the youngest living composer, apparently, to have to ever have had music performed at the proms. So if there are any music students in the audience tonight, uh, NB, don't hang about. Um, since then, he's written uh, various commissioned orchestral pieces, also chamber music, choral and piano pieces. Uh, and he's been in great demand as a conductor um, internationally. Um, he's described as the leading British composer of his generation. Martin Primp on, on this side. Um, has similarly been described by the critic Alex Seertz as one of the most exciting British playwrights to emerge in the 1980s. Um, and he is a, a, a very prolific writer with at least 17 plays performed since then, I think. Uh, besides the libretto of the opera we're going to hear about tonight and another um, collaboration with George Benjamin, or an another opera, He's also written more than 10 translations, often of classic plays by writers such as Molière, Marivaux, and Chekhov. His first six plays were performed at the Orange Tree Theatre in Richmond, um, and seven of his plays have also been staged at the Royal Court Theatre, where he became writer-in-residence in 1997. And his plays are now frequently performed in Europe. Possibly his most highly regarded, and certainly the um, most innovative one, uh, is Attempts on Her Life, first performed at the Royal Court in 1997, uh, and I gather translated into 20 languages since then, and also revived at the National Theatre, which is, is a great uh, honor. Um, and his most recent play, I think it's the, the most recent performed, uh, In the Republic of Happiness, was staged at the Royal Court in 2012. As, as I mentioned, Written on Skin um, is the second collaboration between uh, George and Martin, Into the Little Hill, uh, 2008, was um, fairly loosely based on the fairy tale of the Pied Piper of Hamelin, and I think might come into the discussion today. Um, can, can I just get, get a sense of how many of you already know the opera, or know the story of it? Because we were wondering whether we should talk about the story. Okay, so quite a few, but not everybody. 
Um, so I'd better say a little bit about it. It um, recounts the story of a, um, a character known as the Protector, a, a wealthy um, man who commissions a young artist to create an illuminated book to celebrate his possessions, uh, his lands and his family. Um, but he's sort of unprepared for what the boy is going to paint and the effect that it will have, particularly on his wife, Agnès. The text is based um, on the, the legendary story of the medieval troubadour, Guillaume de Cabestain, who fell in love with the wife of the Lord of Rossillon. Uh, and the Lord killed Cabestain and fed his wife her lover's heart. Um, and there's you know, the, the, the sort of famous passage where which comes up in all the versions where she says, you know, uh, it's so delicious that nothing else will ever, you know, sort of pass her lips again and then um, commit suicide. Um, Martin Crimp has rewritten the story, um, modernizing it in various fascinating ways that, that I think we'll be talking about, um, <coughs> making it speak to, to timeless topics as well. I thought perhaps where we should start the conversation uh, was on that question of collaboration, which is um, obviously something that opera composers and librettists have to do, but in, in other fields, like in the literary field, what, the one I work in, it's quite rare for writers to collaborate. Um, but I think it's always an interesting question of how it, how it happens and why. So can I ask you how the collaboration came about? Um, George, do you want to...? Well, it, it came about in, in a way thanks to this place here because one of my colleagues in the music department used to be Professor Lawrence Dreyfus, a wonderful musician, viola de gamba player and an expert on German music who's written superb books on Bach and Wagner. And we had lunch one day and like everybody for the pre previous 25 years, and I'm not really exaggerating, I, at some point in the meal, I said, do you know anybody who might be able to write a text for an opera for me? And he said, he thought for a second, then he mentioned Martin's name and mentioned, he said, well, his words were, he thought he was a genius. And he said, uh, well, maybe, just leave it with me. And in the next three days, he fixed all manner of things to, to such a point that when Martin and I made contact, uh, it, it, we, we felt happy with arranging to l have lunch together, and we had lunch together, and it clicked. Yes, I um, was wondering whether I should ask both of you the same question and then see if the story is <laughs> tallied or not, but I'll, I'll be kind. Oh, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that version of the story. Mm. The, story. Um, but the thing is that Lawrence Dreyfus also knew that I was interested in music, um, and I'm probably one of the few playwrights in the country who's read his, his book on Bach's Continuo Group. <laughs> so um, he knew that I, that I had this interest. Mm. And um, the fact is that I've sometimes, I'd already experimented with, with um, writing lyrics in some of my plays. Mm. It's not quite the same thing. And how does the process work? Do you write the words first and hand them over to George? Or is it a more collaborative process even at that stage? Um, how would you describe it? It was much more collaborative to start with. There's a period of months when we have to decide what we're going to do mm. and how many voices and what, all sorts of things. And this is a very fascinating part of the process, full of uncertainty, because you don't know what's going to result. But uh, equally fascinating when you have to invent a world. And like with any work, you have to invent a world. But this is interesting because you're sharing the world with someone. And it's quite difficult at first because you, well, someone like me, and I was 45 when I, this process started, so not young. And uh, you have to, sh it's quite difficult at first to share like this. Uh, and you're a little bit suspicious of, of each other and at first, and it takes a bit of time to get, gain confidence. And then it proves to be fascinating and stimulating. And, but there comes the point then when I have to leave Martin to, to, to do his work alone. Yes, yeah, so having, having, agreed, I suppose, on a core story, then I have to do my work first, really. But we perhaps discuss a structure in advance. And with Written on Skin, the work we're talking about, because it's a big piece, it's a big structure, there is more discussion of the work in progress. I think it's the opera is in three parts, and I think I delivered the three parts 
correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember now, it's such a long time ago, but I delivered the three parts, one at a time, and then we would discuss that work in progress, and um, perhaps I would talk about some of the ideas. I mean, I can give you a concrete example of that, in that, um, in this story, one of the, the characters is an illuminator of manuscripts. So I had an idea that you could present, because this is quite a perverse idea really, but you could present an illuminated um, picture on stage through words and music. And, uh, and so at, at key points in the text, one of these illuminated pictures appears. And I, and I thought there should be four of them, but George said, no, there should be three. So as we were discussing the, the architecture, it sounds really banal, do you see what I mean? But these are the kind of concrete nuts and bolts of making an architecture together, which is really what you're having to do. And he's also having to think in advance, really, about his, what, uh, whatever the word is, overarching structure, because there are certain uh, elements within the the text of words, which are going to be eventually non-negotiable, therefore we have to negotiate them in advance. Mm. I didn't start composing till I had the, mm. all three acts, parts together, mm. till I had a complete text. Yes, and I read somewhere that you um, started composing not at the beginning, but yes. um, in, in the, one of the quieter passages. Um, the well, this is a pretty frightening and extreme story. And I don't know who, well, I'm sure there's some people that could start in one of the more, the more extreme places, but I didn't feel I could. I need to find the language and the way you write the music. And the best place to start, I discovered, was somewhere quiet, somewhere calm, where perhaps something is beginning, so the beginning of the, this element of the story could go in together, to go together with the beginning of my musical language for this piece. So uh, I, start, I started in, in the fourth or 15 scenes where the, um, the illuminator is working and it's springtime and the, uh, the protector's wife visits him surreptitiously, she shouldn't be there, and begins to ask slightly impertinent and flirtatious questions of him. And it's the quietest and calmest scene of the work. And from then on, I jumped a little bit ahead and then wrote chronologically and then I saved up the most difficult, challenging scenes for me for the end of the process of composing the opera. Not, <clears throat> it sounds like we're about to hear that. Quite yes. Soon, okay, let <laughs> me example. perhaps be... Um, so, the, uh, the boy, the illuminator, has entered into the house of the protector. He wasn't welcomed at all by his wife, who was suspicious of him. And so I've said, she walks up the staircase into his room and begins to look at what he's doing. And at first, he ignores her. And then after about five or six rather increasingly impertinent questions, of, she gets so close to him that she's in his light and he has to turn to her and say, you're in my light, and their eyes meet. And from that point on, the story is, is sealed, basically. What's going to happen will happen. So could we perhaps have the, the first half of this scene, please?
One thing I wanted to ask about um, passages like that is that uh, you have a, a fascinating device you, you use um, in the writing where the characters are um, not only acting the parts but commenting on themselves in the third person. So they say, you know, what do you want, says the boy, and the boy says that. And then she answers, to see, says the woman. Um, and it, it has a very curious effect, I think, and I wanted to ask um, sort of what, what you wanted that device to do and, and why it seems hmm. right for this piece. Well, <clears throat> I think it came out of the, a discussion that George and I had and that I write, when I write a play, I write two kinds of drama. I write what I would call um, illusionistic drama, which is where people uh, have conversations and you accept that that's the conversation they're having and it's, I suppose you call it fourth wall naturalism. But I, I also write a kind of drama which I describe as narrated drama, in which you do the thing that you're not supposed to do in plays, in that um, <laughs> rather than show, you tell. Uh, and this idea of the narration fascinated George, who he will talk more eloquently about this than me, who I, has a kind of uh, a problem with the idea of people just singing normal dialogue to each other without there being any twist or uh, deformation to that transaction. So it's really something that I introduced into the text to, uh, I think, liberate you, would that be the right thing to say, from pure full-on dialogue. It, it's like there's a, a, a grain of, of salt or something which um, assists the compositional process. To such a degree that without it there wouldn't be an opera, <laughs> I think, and that's the case for both of our works mm. so far. Um, it's writing opera today is not like it was in the 19th century or writing at Puccini or Janacek or Wagner's time. Uh, the movies have come along, the speakies, and things have changed, I think, a lot. And I think m most composers acknowledge this, and some of the ways that composers solve this problem is by not telling stories, or even by having not people not sing at all during operas, or by doing anti-operas, ritualistic operas. But there is, a tr there is a difficulty with representing the core issues of opera, basically love and death, straight on, on the, on the stage. And it, I think the, the reason behind it <coughs> is in part the films. And one of the reasons, apart from I hadn't met someone like Martin for two and a half decades, this was the big issue for me about how could I set a love scene if, if it was normal talking? It would seem kitschy, it would seem, funny enough, artificial, even embarrassing. And this tiny little device of having people acknowledge that they're not pretending to be real, the real people, but they're telling you, the audience, that we're singing this for you, we're telling the story for you. Um, it, it simply then allows me to forget about the problem acknowledge it, forget about it, and I think and hope that many of you seeing the opera would also feel the same way, and then I can be spontaneous and emotional as the story needs to be. Um, equally, as if, if you were to see the whole opera, you'd see the way that Martin uses this device is far from simple. It's a very, the words are unbelievably simple, but, but they change function as the work develops. And that is also fascinating for me. Great, basically, the narration element gets dissolved into the story, and by the end of the opera, it's become naturalistic. And that process, and also the ju I find, I don't know why, but hearing people refer to themselves while they're flirting with each other, and indeed making love with each other, is what happens at the end of the first act, is much more enticing for me to set than if it was just naturalistic. Mm. Because I, 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 either it would seem very weird to be setting it in the 21st century, or kitsch would result. So it's a very simple device that I found completely liberating. Yes, that's really fascinating. And it's complicated, isn't it, by the, um, by the fact that one of the people involved doing this isn't exactly a person, but is an angel. Um, because the piece is framed by this chorus of angels, three of them at the start, um, one of whom then becomes the character of the boy. Um, and so I wanted to ask, sort of, why, why angels? What are they doing in this? Why yes. angels? That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> well, really, this was to solve 
I mean, George has his problems to solve as a, as a composer in the 21st century who is trying to write human interactions in a way which is meaningful to us now. Um, for me, the, the problem which I had to solve was we chose a story which was written in the 13th century originally. And as somebody who only really writes dra drama, off stage drama there, drama which is set now in our time, I, for me it's a big problem to think about something set in the 13th century. You know, what am I going to do? This is some kind of, is this some kind of uh, plate rattling, um, horizontal, uh, 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 medieval historical drama? What do I do about this? Now my first instinct was to completely modernize it, take this story, update it, set it in the 21st century. But the more that I got into the story um, and examined this particular period, the more I realized I wanted to keep the cultural specificity of that 13th century world. But I, I couldn't just put a costume drama and make a costume drama and hand it over to George. So it was part of this, this self-consciousness of, 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 of as, as a playwright that made me invent, finally getting to answer your question, invent um, angels supernatural beings, if you like, who have a, a modern sensibility and who are then able to act as bridges uh, to animate the old story. So I have 21st century angels and I can also keep the integrity of the original medieval story. So that's what the angels were about. And the mm. fact that one of the angels crosses, as it were, from the uh, contemporary world into the old world is kind of what we do, I think, as an audience when we uh, enter the world of the opera. We cross from our world now into that world then, but at the same time um, we recognize um, the, the, the common things that we share. And, and why is it the boy who's that character who, who you know, crosses over from angel to, to human rather than Agnès, say? Because in the triangular relationship, it's the boy who is the catalyst. Therefore, it's the catalyst who comes from this world and is brought in. I was very curious about where the story came from. I mean, how you got onto the, this 13th century story. We have to thank um, Martin's <laughs> oldest daughter for that, I think. Well, we, 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 um, the person who, who commissioned the work uh, is the person who runs the festival uh, in Aix-en-Provence called Bernard Focrou. And he's a very discreet man. He wouldn't dream of saying what he wanted an opera to be about. But he did say that it would be very interesting if it was related to the place where the opera is going to have its premiere. And so that sent me, both of us, to look at uh, Provencal texts. And so I, um, my daughter was at that time uh, studying uh, French literature and her supervisor, a guy called Bill Bergwinkel, gave me a reading list. So I, I had my Provencal reading list and then I kind of filtered it and then we, we looked at some of the things and, and talked about them together. So that's how, that's how it came about. Mm. <clears throat> and of course, in the original story, um, Guillaume de Cabestang is um, a, a, a troubadour, a, a poet, composer, and performer. So you're thinking, in a way, a, a gift figure for a composer and a playwright to, to use in a, um, a piece like this. And yet you change him into a visual artist, an illuminator. So why did you do that? Well, I say a little, but I think George then should, should mm. say something about it because I, uh, the decision, well, I'm not sure, I can't remember whether I made that decision or whether we both made that decision, but uh, I think I just thought that um, having a, a, a singer kind of cancels itself out in an opera because everyone's singing. 
<laughs> so then I, I decided it would be someone who, who made pictures, because I think pictures are something which are useful for you. Is that right? There's two reasons for that. One, is, as Martin said, pictures. He, he, he not only does he do pictures, but he describes them, and, and not only in the three miniatures that Martin's already mentioned, but at several points, his art, his skills, his genius as, a, as an ima image maker allows Martin to produce some very juicy text for me to set, full of color, full of imagery and form as well. So that really uh, was helpful as, an, as a source of inspiration and color to the work. But um, we like challenging ourselves and each other, and the first work we had written, Into the Little Hill, tells a story of the Pied Piper, and a very important character in that is the Pied Piper, or as we call him, the stranger. And he is a person who, through the magic of his extraordinary music, is able to make rats disappear, and then children follow him into, into, uh, into the mountain, into the hill. And, um, we didn't want to attempt to set at the heart of a story a second magic musician. That was the main reason for me. Mm. The, the, um, it seems to me the music changes when you're describing the, um, the, the, the images in the piece. And I wonder if you could say a bit about how you wanted them to be different musically. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we both went to the British Library <coughs> to look at an original 12th century manuscript. Mm. Not only to look at it, but to feel it which is a weird experience. It's like touching, this, I imagine, the surface of a, the skin of a whale or something. It's very waxy, it's quite thick, and the, the, it's, cool, it's cold. And the ter terrifying thing is it's 800 years old, but it feels completely new. And the, the colors haven't faded. Mm -hmm. um, the wonderful thing about medieval manuscripts are, of course, the form, which is so fascinating, the geometry involved, the very simplistic perspective, the but above all, it's the color, of course, these precious lapis lazuli cobalt, and above all, the use of gold. And um, as this was going to be a central part of the opera, uh, at many points, I wanted, to, as exactly as you said, Max, I wanted to isolate these moments and to make them stand out so that in your ear's eye, you could hear, if such a thing exists, you could hear that, that something unusual was being, taught, was being sung about. And I did that by, two, by doing two things, surrounding these passages on either side, including what you heard there, by a degree of grayness, simplicity in the sound, softness in the orchestra so the words can be sung softly and heard. And then when the illuminator is at work or described at work, I use some quite exotic sounds to make it his, his world stand out. That involves a specific type of harmony that would bore you if I talked about it. Um, but uh, it involves, t related to that timbre, uh, some exotic instruments like bowed cowbells and low harp harmonics, um, and even more than that, low trumpets and medium register trombones played very loudly with what are called practice mutes. They are invented so people can practice their instruments in hotel rooms, and you can play fortissimo and it sounds very soft. But the sound quality is not the same as someone playing softly. It's an extraordinary sound quality. You can hear the pressure. And the mixture, I use that a lot. And even at the end of, in one or two places, I use an archaic instrument, a viola da gamba, which is, I don't think, really almost ever been used in, in, an, in a modern orchestra, and another very rare instrument as well, a glass harmonica. And the result, I hope, is that the timbral world of the illuminator and his work sort of glistens in a way uh, completely unlike anything else in the whole piece. Mm. I think one of the things um, one, one feels hearing those um, passages is that um, they're not just about um, you know the sense of sight, but they're about visionariness as well, about um, a kind of experience of something beyond um, the, the the real world. Uh, and you get that particularly when. Um, the boy first does an, an example of his work, and the protector and Aeneas are both looking at it, and they both see very different things in it, don't they? And um, you know, he sees, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an image of um, starving men and, and a, a rich man sort of being merciful and, and helping them, feeding them. Um, and Aeneas's reaction is, is of horror, and you know, she says, but there aren't people starving around here. It, it seems like an outrage to her. Uh, as if she feels that something is is wrong, and she says, "What does, um, what does this boy want? What does this thing, this picture, mean?" Uh, 
And then the protector looks at it and he sees, this, sees an image of himself in it as the, the merciful rich man, you know, sort of um, being, being, you know, spreading charity to, to his um, sort of feudal vassals or whatever. Um, and that sense of, of, of the, the, the difference the different things people can take away from those images is very striking and, and um, a kind of rather disturbing moment in the opera, isn't it? Where um, you know that question of what does what does the image mean is something that the music seems to linger on. Nineteenth mm -hmm. um, century operas tell you usually what to feel yes. at any given moment, yeah. and uh, I don't think we, by neither of us, want to do that in such a way. There's moments when you have to impose. A, like terrifying moments or murder or something where you can't step back. But there's other moments when you can allow a degree of ambiguity and allow the audience to f perhaps fill in for themselves, give them some space. That would be uh, my, my feeling as, in as much as it's possible to do that with music. Yes, no, that's interesting. I mean, uh, and immediately after that scene, there is one of those terrifying dramatic moments, isn't there, where... Um which I think, we, is that an example we were going to listen to? Well, there's the, the, the worst one is, no, that's the scene three I've gone later ah, okay. in the example I've chosen, but it's very similar. Yeah. Um, do you want should I to mention it now? Yes, okay. The, the other two angels, the ones that aren't the boy, are basically like, Martin, is it free? Is it set, right, so it's like a Greek chorus? Yeah, yeah, I would think that's right, yes. They, they stand by, they comment on what's happening, they're pretty pitiless about mankind and his destiny mm -hmm. and very harsh about him. And as the, as the tragic tale is, is, is leading towards its denouement, the boy's murder, they, uh, for the last time, they attack man and all that he does with, and that's, this, is from the, this is the scene where the quote that you gave us at the beginning, to, to, to where the protector says, make man, what is it, to make man be ashamed to be human? Mm. Or and uh, at the, this, it's, it's very, very harsh indeed and, and cruel about us human beings, and um, towards the end of the scene, the, the protector joins in with the other two angels, they make a trio, and three choices are given to him about whether to be to negotiate with the boy and find some re middle ground to pardon him, or to slit his throat, and it's obviously the, the last one that he chooses. Shall we, do you want me to play that? Yes, please. Thank you. Let's have number two, please. It starts loudly. <laughs> I want... <laughs>
seem to me sometimes to be even worse than that, that, that in, in some of the choruses they seem almost to be urging people on to, to commit um, acts of brutality. And that, that seemed quite a striking choice, or, or, do, or do you think that's going too far? I don't know. I read, I read quite a lot about angels. I've never read anything about angels before doing this. It's not my kind of normal bedtime reading. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, I think it's Hildegard of Bingham talks about angels put thoughts into the mind mm. of men. So I suppose I was thinking about that with a little bit like gins and genies too, actually. I realized that this exists in many different cultures. Um, and I suppose the other thing I was thinking about these angels, often they, they, this thing about making man ashamed to be human, they um, digest some of the ideas that I found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is also something I hadn't read for a very, very long time, but my mother was ill and I read the Bible aloud to her sometimes in her care home and I was, <laughs> I found this quite a disturbing experience because Genesis is so weird because the world gets created like this and then gets destroyed just like that immediately afterwards, you know, just because God's in a really bad mood. And then, and then Adam is made ashamed, you know, it's really, it's a really disturbing stuff. And so it's the angels who reflect some of this back to us, make us ashamed to be human, expel man from joy with a lacerating whip and so on and so forth. So I wanted to bring some of that material into it and that's what I mean about wanting to maintain that, that specificity, I suppose. And then when I looked at the, some of the medieval interpretations of, of the New Testament, um, that all became quite interesting to me as well. Yes, I see. Um, but the fact that the angels are 21st century angels, mm -hmm. though, does, as, as you were suggesting, kind of bridge the, the times and um, imply that, you know, that the, the violence and the destructiveness is our problem as well as, uh, as, as the medieval world's problem. Uh, and it did make me wonder about the title written, in, uh, written on skin, which um, I, I think George has said in an interview, is, uh, you know, and has just said this evening, is, is primarily about the vellum and the, um, the, the, the not nature in, of not that. It, not uniquely. It's meant also to refer to the erotic element in mm. the story. And at the end of the, the work, she, Agnes, describes how basically his, he, she, he has drawn on her skin. And that's, so it's a double, it's a double entendre, I suppose. But it's almost a, a treble entendre as well, isn't it? In, in that it does possibly imply a kind of violence, um, you know, and maybe summon up images of, um, of you know. So, sorry, yes. Um, Yes, you, close to the microphones, yes. You know, that, that's what one might hear a reference to something like the Holocaust. No, that's not intentional. Or, that's absolutely no, not intentional. No. Martin, I don't think we... No. No, it didn't occur to me. I, no, that wasn't something that I wanted to refer to. I was thinking purely about the, the nature of, the, um, of writing on, on skin to create books and, as George says, the, uh, the idea of erotic touch. Uh, Yes. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> Is that a moment in an academic context to to, to take a <laughs> breath? <laughs> I just, no, but I while you're while you're thinking about that, it's just I, I the, in looking. At, I mean, I just keep thinking about this this handprint here, which I assumed was from a forty thousand year old cave, but I'm told it's from uh, some, a P, somebody's PA doing this on the photocopier, but it made me think about, <laughs> it made me think about human traces. And the, the other thing that was really amazing about looking at this book, the manuscript, which I, I think it's Yates Thompson 39 or something, it's a Catalan um, illuminated text in the British Library. But on one page there was um, a cosmology, which is a series of concentric circles. And when I lifted up the page, you could see in the middle of the circles the little hole where the compass had been put on the page. And I just found that kind of contact with something such a long time ago. Mm. It's so extraordinary. Mm. It's so extraordinary. 
<clears throat> yeah, I mean, it was that sense of, of the contact between the, the past and present that I wanted to ask mm. about, really, because, I mean, there, there, there are moments in the, in the piece where there, there are visions of, you know, what, what will happen in this Provencal landscape uh, in the 21st century, motorways and, mm -hmm. and sort of environmental um, disaster and so on. Um, and that, that gives it a curious sort of um, multiple perspective, doesn't it, in, in time, which, which seems to me a bit like the multiple perspective we were talking about with the, 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 the kind of narration you have. Um, and uh, although, George, you said you didn't want to talk about tonality, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but you've also described tonality as a kind of single uh, perspectivism. Um. And I just wondered whether, whether you felt there was some, whether in the music you wanted to create a, a similar kind of multiplicity or... Y yes. And how, how that works musically. Yes, but not of style. Uh, I think one approach that could have been taken to Martin's text would have been to give the 21st century elements of the story uh, its own sound and to try and write pseudo-medieval music for the other the other world mm -hmm. and all the other elements, giving them a, them a sort of postmodern collage feeling. And I really didn't want that. So I tried to make the piece have one musical idiom and language. But it is true, I think, that in about the period sort of 1600 to 1900, one of the things that is true to tonality is that, that this is very hard to talk about. If it sounds pretentious, please forgive me. But it's, I think the composer takes a single vantage point uh, as, like in perspective and this can be shown that because behind most of that music there can be given to every, every beat of every bar what's called a figured bass even in Beethoven, even in Wagner in, in as much as that the harmony is described as one harmony for every beat and only one harmony from the beginning of the work till the end of its work and even a composer like Ravel was using this figured bass technique to, to sketch his works using very complex harmonies at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, um, one of the things that modern, modernism has shown us is that that perspective can be fractured and can be split and can be bifurcated and that you can't anymore describe necessarily uh, every beat as being this one harmony. Now, in an opera, when people are arguing or uh, or when, as it happens, there can be an erotic m m mood in one uh, actor, one singer, which happens in the eighth scene, and there can be the husband. Agnes gets, uh, after her initial experiences with the boy, tries out the same experiences on her husband <coughs> and tries to instigate some sexual activity with him, which was an absolute taboo for a woman to do in the 13th century. And so she's in a sensual, seductive mood, and he is an initially confused, perplexed, and then furious, angry for this terrible uh, sin that she's doing. And then he starts to, uh, to shout at her, and she tries to maintain her calm, and then they both end up shouting with each other. Now, there's two very different types of emotional activity going on there. And I tried to portray that with two different types of worlds of music simultaneously. And to do that, that means that they each have their own rhythmical life and their own harmonic life and their own timbral life as well, to keep them as far apart as possible so hopefully the audience can follow this. At the same time, they have to sound good and co coherent together. So it means that, that in a way, uh, I have a sort of figured bass, but it's one that's split into two or even three at the same time. And I think that's different from what, it, what composing would have been a hundred years ago or more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Was it sort of clear then? Yes, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, I want to go back to the, the passage uh, Martin mentioned where, where the angels, um, or one of the angels say, sorry, the protector and the angels say, uh, put voices into his mind. Um, which you, you were connecting with Old Testament angels and, and mm -hmm. you know, that sort of sense of um, possession, if you like, by, by, by spirits. Uh, and, and there is that, that moment where the angels are saying different things to the protector, urging him you know, to be merciful or to be violent. Um, you know, and, and it's that, that, that idea of a, of a psychomachia where um, someone is being torn in different directions by spirits is, has a whole tradition of 
um, examples, but, but it also sounds very psychoanalytic from a modern point of view, doesn't it? That idea of putting voices into someone's mind. And I wondered if you were thinking of it, if, if you wanted us to make that connection with you know, what, a sort of modern understanding of where that sort of violence might come from. I hadn't thought of it that way. I mean, obviously, my main objective, I suppose, in writing a text is to, is to, make, it, to make it very open mm -hmm. and to allow interpretation to happen, I suppose. Um, I personally don't think in terms of psychoanalysis, although I suppose when I would be in a rehearsal room with a theatre text, I would talk about motivation probably in psychological terms, but I think that's uh, it, I think it's quite hard for us to, to escape that particular way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. Should we want to, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also in a way what writers do, isn't it, when they're with characters putting voices into their heads, and so I wondered if there was a sense <laughs> of how, um, you know, that, that it was another... That, that it might work like another alienation device? Because there is a kind of Brechtian sense of all this, isn't there? Of well, there is, and there, there is and there isn't, because we've referred to this idea of, of self-narration. Mm. Um, and I think it would be wrong to imagine that within this particular drama, it functions as a, as a Brechtian alienation device, because it is not something that is meant to... Uh, push you back from the drama. Um, it's actually something that works like a hook and pulls you in, I think. So it, it's, it's, I would say it's the opposite of the Brechtian thing. I mean, in relation to psychological, um, uh, uh, psychological world, to human interiority, one of the things that interested me about reading about this period was I'm sure there's some medievalists in the audience who know the dates better than me, but I think at some point in the 12th century, there was um, uh, the bishops or the pope or whoever they were, they all got together and they decided that people would have to confess in the Catholic Church once a year. And I know that some people consider that to be the beginning of modern individualism because people were forced to look inside and see what was going on inside rather than uh, behavior simply being judged as what you did on the outside in the world. I mean, I find that quite hard to believe, to be frank with you, that suddenly you know, this happened and suddenly people looked inside and had a conscience and thought about these things. But it's interesting to imagine that there's a moment where this is, is codified and made formal and made something you're actually supposed to do, whether you did it or not, I don't know. So uh, that, that I found quite interesting. I had a question for, for George, really, which is that, that in describing working on this opera, um, you make yourself sound like a bit of a hermit for a couple of years. You said, said you didn't um, get, go out very much, you didn't even go to operas, you saw very few people uh, and became very isolated, and that you were working like you'd never worked in your life. Well, I mean, having looked at your CV, I don't quite believe that because you've obviously worked fantastically sort of in, in, intensively. Um, all the way through, but, but, but clearly there was something about this work that was different, and I, I just wanted to ask you a bit about what you thought it was about it that had that effect. Well, it is bigger in scale than anything I've ever done. Uh, until I wrote our first collaboration, which is about 40 minutes long, most of my pieces are under 20 minutes, and the idea of writing a piece that lasts an hour and a half filled me with terror, because do I have the tools, do I have the mechanisms, do I have the breadth in order to fill and not make people very bored during that period and sustain uh, the friction and tension of a story like this. But I, I do tend to isolate myself quite a lot while um, writing pieces anyway. I, I sort of like to marinate myself in the sound world of a piece and uh, sort of live in it, and which is good when the piece is flowing and very upsetting when it's not uh, flowing because uh, I'm not very good at distracting myself. Um, but uh, I tend to sketch a huge amount and I throw a very large amount away 
And so each bar can sometimes be written 30 or 40 times till I get it right. And so the sketches for this piece are absolutely gigantic and a lot of hours are needed to be spent, plus the sheer writing of the full score. There's hundreds of pages. And uh, every note has to be heard in my inner ear and sort of answered for. And that just takes a, a lot of time. In fact, I wrote it extremely fast. If, if I'd calculated the normal speed of composing, this piece would have taken me a decade to write. And in fact, I wrote it in 26 months. And that was quite fast. So basically, I, I became a hermit. I stopped traveling. I stopped conducting. I virtually didn't talk to anybody. I would still see my students from here. The moment I finished a scene, I would ring, send them a message saying, if you want to come and see me, I have got two or three days when I'm, before I start the next scene. And they would come and see me. And that was basically my existence for two and a half years. Um, and it's very strange to be like that because the seasons go by and you haven't got much further and another year starts and you think will this ever end and then suddenly it, you write the last note and, it, and you're free <laughs> and it was my birthday I timed it spot on at two o'clock on my 52nd birthday I finished it and how about you Martin was it did it stand out from your I, th I think it, yeah. I, I mean, it st <laughs> stands out for me because I, I really, I'm, I'm, not very, I'm not very good at deadlines, I suppose. And when I write a play, um, I don't normally have a deadline. I kind of indulge myself quite a lot, I suppose. But here's a deadline. I have to, I have, to have something ready because the, the opera world, the demands of the opera world mean that the performance is booked, the singer's are on the way to be being booked. Um, the composer is waiting, and he has, you know, needs his time. So, from that point of view, the the for me, the new thing about that is the, is the deadline. It's the deadline <coughs> and having to complete the work by a particular time. But that's fine. And the other thing, I suppose, is that I'm not used to spending lots of time um, reading secondary texts because. If I write a play, it tends to be something that is just purely imagined, whereas both the, the works that we've collaborated on, I've explored very specific worlds and, and done a lot, of, a lot of reading and inhabiting libraries, which is unusual for me, actually, but it's quite fun, really. I quite like libraries. George, you, you described being, I mean, feeling free when you'd written the last note. Um, but of course that is then the point at which you have to start thinking about production, uh, which is another sort of collaborative process, isn't it? So can you tell us how, th how that worked in, in this case? What was the well, production process? Um, the production process in a way goes back to before I've written a note and before even Martin has finished his text because we chose the singers the, who sang the world premiere and sang it here in London and in many other places. We chose them before the work was even started, basically. I knew I was writing for the wonderful Barbara Hannigan, who plays Agnes, months before I wrote a single note, and the countertenor, and the rest of the cast. They came to my home. Uh, I suppose it was an audition, but I already knew they were wonderful. And I just, but I wanted above all to get to know their voices. And we made music together. Martin came to meet them as well. And I took notes, 20, 30 pages sometimes, of notes on their individual qualities and I shaped everything around them. And uh, it really wasn't, I finished the piece and the next day it all begins. The, the process of both with, and also with our wonderful director, Katie Mitchell, there had been a, a long period of discussion also before, well over a year before she had to do anything involving the piece at all. So we'd, uh, I think we'd, learnt, we'd done the same thing in a much smaller scale for Into, Little, Into the Little Hill and the thought was, that to make something which works, we sort of have to control up to a point everything and be involved in everything as well. Mm -hmm. And um, knowing who you're writing for, knowing their capacities and their weaknesses and their, their brilliance and the beauty of the sound that they make and the fact that, that they, they sing in tune and without too much vibrato, that was not only really profoundly inspirational to me while writing, but also when it came to rehearsing and performing the piece, they, what they did was just in incredible in terms of uh, doing, bringing the work to life. 
I, I gather it's going into a, a new production in Germany. That's so, already, so, that's so, already started, and there's some other ones in, in the pipeline. And, and w will that have the same singers? No, no. Uh, this was entirely different. Ev no one was involved at all in any, yeah. in any way directly with Martin or me, and, uh, and that will be the case with the other ones as well. There comes a point when you have to let go and see what comes out. Mm. Well, I was just wondering what happens to that sense of it being tailored for particular voices when other uh, voices then step in. But the original production, which has been played in several places, at one place or other, one of the main singers was not available. So each of the roles, in fact, has had a, already, in the original production, has had a replacement singer who did, on the whole, extremely well. Um, this, I think, is unusual today, <coughs> but this without any, even the remotest type of comparison, and I didn't know this when I was writing the piece, but Mozart used to do this. He used to write his, his parts for individual singers, mm -hmm. and then, well, people have sung it lots. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the case, I think, with Strauss, yeah. or, and uh, many, many composers, they wrote specifically for singers, mm. but it didn't mean only they could sing it. And presumably for instrumentalists as well. Yes, I had the, the sound world of this the wonderful orchestra for whom I wrote it, but they've only played it once in one production so far, which is the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, but they have, they have a particularly golden, rich, but highly articulate sound. And um, I did compose for that and indeed some of the particular instrumentalists, and again, they played so, so incredibly beautifully at the premiere. Thank you. I've, I've just got one more question before we open things up to the floor, which is um, w whether you're planning any further collaborations. Perhaps, Martin, if you'd like to ask that. Yes, yes, we've <laughs> been booked, really, haven't we? Um, so, yes, we, we intend to do, make another piece together. It's still top secret by the sound of it, is it? Uh, it's not really a secret, but the, the content would always be a secret, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we don't know what it is yet. Either. But its premiere is, is in May 2018, mm. down the road there. So wh whatever it is, you heard it here first. <laughs> um, I think somewhere we have a roving mic, where, uh, yes, which is being held up by our student ambassador there. So um, let, let's invite questions from the floor. Does anyone want to start us off? There's one over there. I just wondered if you'd like to comment a bit more about the collaboration between the two of you. I mean, it sounds like you two get on very well together. Um, but I mean, do you, do, during the period of the composition, for instance, would you maybe ring up Martin and say, uh, I just need a sexier lyric here, or a more dramatic lyric, or a, or, or, or a more aggressive tone to the text here? Or would Martin actually ring you and say, uh, uh, you missed a trick here, you know, <laughs> in some way or other? I mean, what, how does that work? How did you get the emotional quality of the, these extraordinary sounds that we've been hearing? The emotional quality, if there is any, comes very simply from his words, entirely from his words. And I, would ne I never need to ask him, fortunately, to give me any more form of emotional fuel or anything. It's all, and the structural thing as well, is already there in, his, in, what, in the texts he writes for me. Uh, the challenge for me is to represent every single word, every single sentence in a way that is sort of worthy of the words and, and cogent and makes them audible and captures what they're meant to mean or one of the ways they're meant to mean. But while writing, there can be moments of argument where the voices are singing, needing to sing fast and the music needs more length. So there was one moment I'm thinking of where I asked Martin, please give me a few more words here. Same sort of words, but just a few more. Conversely, in lyrical moments, particularly towards the work's ending, um, the, to show the ecstasy of one of the, of Agnes towards the end, she she sings quite slowly and gets through the words at quite a slow pace. And if she carried on at that pace with the number of words, the wonderful words that Martin had written for me, the aria would have lasted 11 minutes, and it had to last about six, well, no, four and a half, or so. it had to be less in terms of mu in terms of the musical structure. So then I have the horrible task of asking him, can I get rid of some of your best words, please? And the amazing thing about Martin is, is that even though the words are written with tremendous rigor and God knows how much effort and time they cost him, he always, always says yes. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, do we have any more questions on the floor? Yes, um, right at the front. <coughs> Thanks. Is that audible? Yeah. Um, you talked about the angels as sort of bridges between the modern world and the story, the, the old story. Um, and that was beautifully lit in browns and golds on the stage. But there was then this kind of um, clinical, brightly lit, white, modern world off to the side. And you, ha and you haven't really said much about how either that came about or what you were doing with it. So I'd be interested in, in hearing a bit about that. Okay, well, that's, that's really a question about the, the work by the stage director, Katie Mitchell, and the stage designer, Vicky Mortimer. And uh, for people who haven't seen the opera in, in, in that production, Katie and Vicky, the, the uh, director and designer, wanted to make it the, two, the separation of those two worlds very clear. So this, um, the stage was on two levels, looks a little bit like a doll's house, I suppose. And in the center of the lower level was very much the medieval world where the medieval characters um, perform their medieval story. But this was also surrounded by uh, what you might call a 21st century world, which was represented by, even in lighting terms, by completely different lighting, by fluorescence, uh, and a kind of archive material of the kind of material that <coughs> one might refer to if one was trying to create this world. So that was, that was the concept um, behind the production which w was here in, Lon in London, the production which began in Aix. So that's, um, that's why it was a, an attempt to separate uh, the two worlds so that then you could see how they come together within the work. Thank you, I think, yes, there's a question. Yeah, you talked a lot in your presentation about harmony and also coherence and in the answer to the first question you also talked about structure but the story itself is very violent and visceral and I wanted to ask you how how you were thinking about that kind of dissonance musically um, the story, what's wonderful, seemed wonderful about me, to, to me is that there were, there's many themes in the story. Many things happen. And some of it is very gentle and erotic. And it does lead to an appalling conclusion which involves torture and murder and horrific, unspeakable things. Um, uh, uh, to start from a practical level, I wanted Martin's words to be heard. That influenced the way I set the voices. But also, I don't like it in the opera house when people have to shout. I like it when they sing, and I don't like them using too much vibrato, which means they have to sing fairly softly. That means the orchestral writing has got to be transparent and often very reticent, so that the whole thing is made intimate, and I hope also that will draw people in. So the, the, it's, in the main, a soft opera, 80% of it. But people don't think so, I think, when they come out. And there's, there's one reason, which is I wanted the few powerful moments where I, it's unavoidable that I have to use muscle in the orchestra to be really violent and really strong. The first one of those, apart from the introduction, you have to wait 45 minutes until the middle of the opera, almost bang in its center. And thereafter, there's about four or maybe five or six more of them. And the, the th not only is there a practical element there, uh, that there's very little singing during those moments because you won't be able to hear those voices, but also, if the norm of the opera brings you in and seems to be often tender in tone and um, quite vulnerable or intimate, that when these things happen, my hope is they create a real shock. And the scene when, after, when the boy is being murdered, it, it doesn't depict his murder. It's not, it's not like film music. It, it's, it's much more formalized than that. But the whole orchestra is playing in a pretty extreme register, all of them, continuously for about two minutes. And therefore, it makes an, an enormous noise from the pit, particularly if you, if you like in Aix, you're in quite a small opera house. So my feeling is that, that uh, off, the thing is an opera composer, you don't have to, f you can allow people to imagine without feeding them with it. It's not film music. You don't have to represent violent things on stage or violent feelings necessarily with violent music. You're, you have the right to subvert and, and hold back. Um, 
but the moments when it lets out uh, are meant to be extreme and in a way compensate for the fact that the piece is often quite subdued. I wonder if I could follow that up a bit by, by asking Martin whether um, you, know, you, you feel when you're writing for opera that you can do different things than when you're writing drama. Well, what's been <laughs> paradoxically the interesting thing for me, I, I'm a dramatist allegedly, but I realized that until I'd done the two pieces for George, I'd never dramatized anything. I'd never taken a story and dramatized it. So this was very interesting for me to take something apart, create a structure whereby I could put it back together again or assemble it in a different way. So that was, um, <laughs> that's strangely a new thing for mm -hmm. me to actually dramatize, which of course was what was normally done until the, 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 the world of the, the, the unique inventor came about and now as a, as a playwright, I'm a, always obliged to make up my own thing, I suppose. So it's quite liberating to know, ah, here's the artifact, I can take it, now I can dramatize it. So that's a, a weird thing about being a dramatist, that paradoxically that the dramatizing is a new and exciting adventure for me. Thank you. There was a woman there. Sorry, yes, there was a question from over there. Thank you. You mentioned about um, how you tried to create different sound worlds for the different characters, but how exactly did you decide on how to create the sound worlds? Like, how do you decide on your instrumentation? How do you decide on the kinds of harmonies and things like that? So, uh, if I get that right, excuse me, you, uh, you want to ask how, uh, how I decide on how to portray in different sound worlds different types of harmony? Each character... Oh. It's not as simple as that. Because I, the, what I described about the world of illumination and painting is fairly unique in the opera. And I didn't use themes normally to say, here is the protector, here is his wife, here is the belief in murder, here is the religious... I didn't try and pinpoint things didactically. But there are still elements which relate to certain characters. Firstly, Agnes, the wife, she really changes. That's the whole point of the opera in a way. She is a downtrodden, humiliated, sad woman with so little freedom given to herself. And through love, she expands and, and becomes a rather triumphant, tragic heroine, I think, by the end. So she really evolves. So her path is very, very much a progressive one and change. So it has to change all the time. The protector has certain characteristics that are stubborn and quite malevolent in some ways, though he's a complex person. And he has some very amiable sides as well, particularly his love for art. And that amiable side, I did use another type of sound, much warmer and simpler in tone than that with through the illumination. If you were to hear the work, there's a the sound of horns and multi-divided cellos using a rich type of harmony. Um, that are associated with him, but that type, that side of him disappears halfway through the work as he becomes more obsessed and out of control and eventually incredibly cruel. How you decide them, you ask me. <laughs> um, well, the thing is, starting a piece is so difficult, finding the world of a piece, and you have to just grasp out of the air <coughs> anything that seems to work, but gradually bits and come together and then you find you have invented a sort of world that allows some type of coherence, but a lot of contrast and some development. And there comes a point when you get even the last third of the opera I wrote in four months at an enormously fast speed, including the orchestration. And then you get the feeling that you, it's writing itself. It's writing very, very fast. In the end, uh, there's two things I'd say. A lot, a lot of technique. I have given lectures here at King's about the operas I love for years. Uh, Wozzeck and Janacek and Strauss and Messiaen and Ligeti and Mussorgsky. And, and that helps me a lot, gives me a lot of information, gives me a lot of stuff to use. So there's the side of you which teaches yourself to write an opera by studying and thinking and reading. And then there's a side which is luck, finding things on the way, and uh, chance and intuition in the end. And I suppose the biggest one is intuition, judging what is right, 
now and what fits in with the whole picture. That's only the intuition. Guided by technique and knowledge can judge that. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, okay, is one right at the front. Thank you for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, I think it was very enjoyable. Uh, my question is basically to George. Uh, you had said you hadn't met somebody like Martin uh, in the 25 years preceding in, in your career. Uh, I, I just wonder if had you met somebody, either Martin or somebody else, previously, would you have had the skills and the intuition to do the same quality of work in a younger version of you, if, it, if that were 15 years ago? And also to Martin then, that creating the, the drama, as you said, and um, creating that different type of work from what you used to uh, create before these two works, if you think you could have had the, the, the same level of, of focus to, to deliver the same quality of work again. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that's really interesting. I'll answer first, because I think George should have the last word. So, um, <laughs> for, from my perspective, yes, I think, I think um, as a writer, I think, if I'm really frank with myself, I think I've developed quite slowly, and I've understood things very slowly as time has gone by, because I, I, I think musicians have a more formal process of training as well, whereby they carefully examine other works and, 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 and see what's going on inside them, which is something that it's taken me much longer to do with plays. And I think it, it well, obviously what's happened has happened, but all I can say is that it, it was very clear to me what needed to be done, and that was to subtract partly my own ego, but partly the things that I do to write plays, which be very quick about this, since plays stopped being written in verse, which is quite a long time ago, but you have to do something to them to make them feel um, uh, um, integral and as if they're always there, and that's about rhythm and about writing the music. So when you write a play, you, the writer, have to also write the music. When you write for a musician, no. You must not write the music. You must not do that thing. You must withdraw it. You must entirely withdraw it. And also, you must understand about economy of means. At a very simple level, a 90-minute play will be something like 70 pages long. And a, nine, a text for a 90-minute opera will be almost exactly half that, so 34 pages in this case. So it is a very precise skill and a kind of subtraction of ego, which is required, I think, for this job. So. But George will have something to say about his experience, I'm sure, in this. Well, very simply, working with Martin has had a transformational effect on me as a composer. It seems to me primarily in speed, quadrupling, octupling my uh, speed of writing, but maybe also perhaps improving it as well. And therefore, I think, oh gosh, I wish I'd been doing this for 25 years and already had seven operas in my catalogue. But... There, I probably wasn't, I had some nuts and bolts to work out linguistically, polyphony, structure, harmony, all sorts of aesthetic and, and technical things. <coughs> and I probably wasn't right and ready to collaborate till we met, actually. And uh, the thing that I'm so grateful for is that we probably met at the right time. <laughs> <clears throat> and that is the right time, I think, to uh, wrap things up for tonight. But before I do that, let me just um, remind you that uh, you're uh, very welcome to join us for the reception, which is just outside in the lobby um, in that direction. Uh, and that at 8.30 on the sixth floor in this building, there'll be the screening of um, Written on Skin, which I hope you'll be able to stay for and enjoy. Uh, and before then, please join me in, in thanking our two speakers for sharing the, this amazing insight into how they work together. It's been really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Thank you.